pleased to welcome you back to the class. It's been a couple of weeks since we met, and uh, I'm looking forward to this sort of new innovation that we're going to have in the way we conduct the class on online. Um, so this is the first online lecture. Basically, these are the same slides that we would have used in class, and I'm going to um, append a voiceover to them. Uh, I'll ask you to recall the email that I sent on March 12th to all of you. So please read that again carefully for the requirements, and uh, particularly those associated with the assignments, and your commitment to offer a comment, question, or concern in response to the talk uh, that we're going to have. Um, so today we're going to take on the understanding of the regression to the mean model in theory, as economists uh, think of it. I mentioned to you last day that if you want to be an active an active participant in this literature, either as a policymaker or as a, um, a researcher, it is a must that um, that you've read Gary Solon's uh, American Economic Review uh, uh, paper. And that's what we talked about last time, a whole host of issues around measurement. Well, if that's the case, it's equally a must that you read the uh, crucial uh, paper in the theory of mobility, and that's a paper by Gary Becker and Nigel Tomes in the Journal of Labor Economics in 1986. And this is the one of the core readings in the uh, reading list uh, for this lecture. Uh, the readings also being uh, listed on, on the website, and you know where to get uh, that. So Becker and Tomes is the workhorse model. It's the starting point. Uh, that model has certainly evolved a lot over the, um, the years since it was written. Um, um, but we need to know it. And we're going to spend a lot of time on it in this lecture, or go through it in this lecture, um, but also point to some refinements, point to some predictions that it leads, and um, perhaps sort of sketch out directions for further consideration. Okay, so that's what we're up to. Um, just reflecting on the last couple of lectures, we've noticed that um, in our review of the empirical literature, there's a wide range of estimates of the intergenerational elasticity. And we underscored that we certainly have to be aware of the host of data limitations and measurement issues that, that go into understanding that literature. So not all studies are created uh, equally. It's easy, obviously, to be uh, an armchair quarterback and, and look back and criticize studies. But researchers always try to do the best they can uh, with their understanding of theory and statistical methods and given the data they have at the time that they do it. But we should never read the studies, we should never read the literature uncritically. Uh, uh, and we've shown that um, a consensus seems to be emerging that the most reliable estimate of the intergenerational elasticity for the United States is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6, although if you do a comprehensive reading of the literature, those estimates could range from as low as 0.1 to all the way to the upper end of uh, uh, 0.6. The other thing that we're aware of, there are substantial differences across space, certainly between countries. That's what the Great Gatsby Curve was about, a significant variation across countries. And um, the World Bank report we're reading just underscores that all the more by bringing over 70 countries in, into that mix. So even using sort of um, the best possible data with comparable methods, we get a broad range. And uh, we're going to see, uh, perhaps not so much in this lecture, but in the coming lectures, and in fact one of the presentations that one of you will be doing, about the importance of variations within countries. So this sort of sets up a whole need for, uh, for theory, not just in sort of structuring our, uh, our empirical approach to uh, the data, but in helping us to understand the kind of differences between countries. All the more so when we also think about differences across time, which also motivates public policy in a, in a good deal of the way. My own view is that it's much more difficult to identify or understand um, 
differences in time in a, in, a, in a causal framework. But that is certainly out there in the literature and we'll talk about that a bit. Finally, I wanted to uh, uh, highlight one of the points that we've sort of left a bit unaddressed up until now, and that's the that the elasticity seems to differ in peculiar ways across the income distribution. Uh, the intergenerational degree of income mobility is different for lower income, middle income, and upper income uh, families. And so in part today we'll look to theory to help guide us uh, through that, to offer us some predictions, and to sort of critically understand how we might adapt uh, theory. The other thing you might keep in mind is some of the early lectures we had in the, in the course. Um, I, I primed you with sort of a, um, an overall uh, framework. So think back to the early lectures and we talked about the overlapping influence of family, market, and state. We're going to give more precision uh, to that notion uh, in, in this lecture. Just a sense of some contrasting views that are out there in uh, the Becker uh, Tomes um, uh, uh, Journal of Labor Economics paper, we have a rather confident view of uh, mobility, and I've taken these quotes directly from the papers, that any um, differences um, uh, between uh, 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 individuals, uh, between the, the family background of individuals, gets wiped out within three uh, uh, generations. So the implication is there that the, um, the intergenerational elasticity is relatively low and, um, and stable for, for that matter. And um, there might be some sort of linked or, or some sort of stickiness between your income and your parents' income, but um, basically no relationship at all between your income and your grandparents' income. So the so-called shirt sleeves, some shirt sleeves in three generations. Um, meaning that people go from uh, manual, um, uh, intense work to, uh, I guess, more comfortable uh, office work in a very short uh, span of time intergenerationally. And that's to be contrasted by this provocative uh, book by uh, Greg Clark, who's an economic historian at um, University of California, Davis, uh, summarizing his research agenda in a Princeton University Press book published in 2014. And he talks about, um, uh, and he puts it this way, uh, uh, an underlying law independent of social structure and government policy um, with a, a B, he calls it a B, or a, a version of our beta, or some sort of intergenerational elasticity of status that is uh, around 0.7 to uh, 0.8 in all societies at all times, whether they were feudal and or whether they were governed by a mixed economy with a substantial welfare state, uh, whether that society be China, uh, India, or Western Europe, that elasticity is pretty high and regression to the mean is pretty slow. So the same families tend to occupy the same positions in the uh, uh, hierarchy uh, across generations, uh, uh, for many generations. And it's, re it's interesting to read Clark's work because of the methodology. Um, and he's using a different approach based upon uh, surnames uh, as opposed to individual data. And we'll speak a little bit about that when we look to different methods, uh, particularly uh, some of the methods that, methods, uh, methods that the World Bank used in, in, in its uh, uh, report. I think actually the Clark book is one of the books that uh, is on the reading list that you can offer to do a book review about. But it all starts here with this picture I've pulled from the website of a museum uh, in London, the University, uh, 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 the UCL. And um, this is a picture of some very dried up and, and more than century old dried peas. And there's about a hundred of them. And these peas are famous because they're Francis Galton's peas. And Francis Galton, as you know, was the uh, social scientist, uh, geneticist, who worked in the uh, 1880s and late 1800s. Uh, 
And it's to Galton we owe uh, many things. In, in fact, the whole eugenics movement sprang up from uh, Galton's work. And he was very interested in heredity and how advantage was passed across generations. And so he did an experiment. Uh, Francis Galton planted a garden. And he asked his uh, friends to help them. And they planted sweet peas in different plot plots around uh, England. And um, Galton... Um, sent his friends little packages of peas, um, peas that he had carefully measured the diameters of uh, uh, as best as he could with the instruments available uh, to him. And he waited for harvest time and had his friends send him back the progeny of those parents. And you can see here in uh, what's called Table 2, which I pulled from a, a, one of uh, Galton's books, uh, a summary of that uh, experiment. This column is the diameter of the parent seed, ranging from 21 hundredths of an inch all the way down to 15. And over here, he's grouped the filial seeds, the, uh, the offspring, uh, according to their uh, diameter. And it's quite clear that uh, the um, smaller the diameter, the, the less advantage uh, the parent, the more likely that the child P, <laughs> if I can use that term, uh, is also going to be of a low uh, diameter. And he um, then smooths his data by taking uh, 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 um, 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 means. Now if you look closely at his, at his work, it's very probable and he goes on to do a regression analysis. And this is where re the term regression come from. Least squares uh, has its origins in Galton's work, his notion of regression to the mean. And we use least squares regression all the time in, 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 our, in our work. But it refers very much in a substantive way to the model that Galton had in mind of intergenerational transmission of, um, of uh, healthy or uh, bigger P's, uh, of P characteristics across uh, the generations. So that's where we get the word regression, uh, regression uh, to the mean, and the least squares methods that Galton, uh, uh, um, uh, he didn't fully use them, but he sort of led the, uh, set the groundwork for the uh, development. Okay. I, for, I actually forget what what the uh, beta estimate is in Galton's piece, but it's very easy. You can go to the website and download uh, these data and, and run it. I think it's around 0.6 or 0 0.7, if I, if I remember correctly. So Clark's work is not so far off of uh, Galton. And it's interesting how much weight um, uh, 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 Clark puts on the hereditary, hereditary transmission of, uh, of status. Now, he's using a broader term uh, uh, status than just, uh, just I income. But he's coming up with an estimate that's pretty high by our contemporary standards. Okay, all that's by way of introduction. Um, so um, Becker and Tomes first wrote on this subject um, in a 1979 Journal of Political Economy uh, uh, paper. Uh, Nigel Tomes was actually a PhD student of uh, a student of Gary uh, uh, Becker's. And after 1971, Glenn Lowry, uh, who was an MIT graduate, published a paper uh, in 1981 in Econometrica that adapted the model slightly. I think it was all his, his own ideas, but it got, I think, um, Becker and Tomes thinking, and they revised their model in 1986. And the crucial distinction between the 1979 and 1986 Becker and Tomes articles is the way that parental income comes to influence um, child outcomes. And that channel, that causal channel, works through credit markets and the degree to which they are imperfect. And so the 1986 uh, paper, which we're going to discuss, refers to um, imperfect credit markets. But the setup is an overlapping generations model which, with, with all individuals living for two periods. So, I mean, it's quite an abstraction. You spend the first period of your life as your child, as a child, and then your second period as a parent, having a child investing, and then you die in, 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 in that period. So they, they're just focusing on a generational time frame 
trying to bring out this idea of transmission. The other thing that's crucial is, um, uh, is that we are focusing here just on, if you will, one parent in the family who has one child. And the abstraction here is from the marriage market. So we're not going to get into uh, differences of gender uh, or assertive mating or how the marriage market complements or substitutes uh, uh, with the labor market to uh, uh, lead to certain patterns of intergenerational mobility. Um, this is in part why I think the early literature focused on fathers and sons very much wanted to get a good measure of, of, of wage rates and abstract from all the other dynamics in, in the family. So it is an abstraction, but there is another literature out there, and we'll get to it eventually, and I think one of you is actually going to focus in their term paper uh, on this topic, so it'll be interesting to, to, uh, to see that uh, paper uh, become more familiar with this literature. But the point is, in the first generation, or rather, um, in the first period, um, the parent has to divide um, their current income between consumption and investment in the child's earning capacity. And then in period two, those investments have a payoff that the child receives from the market, and the child in turn must make a consumption and investment decision for the for the next generation of children. And so there's always this sort of two generations alive at, uh, at, 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 at one period, and uh, we use this overlapping generations uh, uh, setup. The other crucial thing in the model, and this borrows from the 79 paper, is that the child receives an endowment. And this endowment is independent of um, um, investment choices, okay? So, in some sense, and maybe this is not fully correct to say as, as these models have gotten refined over time, this endowment is not part of human capital. So human capital is anything that influences your earnings capacity that's subject to economic incentives, to economic choice. But this endowment also influences the productivity of those investments in uh, human capital, it, influ it you know there's a human capital um, production function, and um, uh, and that production function is subject to uh, diminishing marginal productivity, but the endowment will shift that production function and change those marginal uh, productivities. <clears throat> That'll become clearer in a second. Yeah, I, I, I guess the great disadvantage of uh, this online approach is. Um, uh, we're not able to interact as the um, presentation goes along, and I can't see the fear in your eyes. Um, but hang in there, and we will have an opportunity to have conversation uh, e online um, uh, through the question and answer period. Now here's the setup. It's summarized in this picture when capital markets are perfect. And the important result here is that when, when access to capital uh, is perfect, um, there is no causal role for parental income. Okay, so, uh, and I've got this quote from the paper, this model separates the transmission of earnings from the generosity and the resources of parents. Okay, in perfect capital markets, the underlying ability of the child is fully realized. So what do we mean by perfect capital markets? Is, is, it's as if you could use the child's future earning power as collateral to borrow uh, from capital uh, 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 markets. Um, and and they, they model that in this space, where the vertical direction is the rate of return, the interest rate, and the horizontal direction is the amount of investments um, parents make on their kids. Regardless of those investments, in, in, when the capital markets are perfect, they face the same interest rate. Okay? So it's like, you know, going out to buy a car. You're going to buy a car or, or a house. The bank is looking for collateral. It'll take ownership of the house or uh, your other assets or the car or your other assets as, as collateral. And the same thing's going on here, but it's your child's earning capacity <laughs> that is the, uh, 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 the, the collateral. 
The downward sloping function is that marginal productivity curve I just referred to. Uh, more parental investments increase the child's human capital. Presumably that's why they've labeled this age. Um, uh, but they do at a diminishing uh, uh, rate. And then these curves are drawn for a given endowment uh, uh, that the child receives, E in this case, and E prime. So in their vocabulary, you might think of someone with endowment E prime being more, quote unquote, able than someone born with an endowment of E. That is, they can turn a certain amount of child investment, uh, parental investment, into more human capital, okay? And then we take that human capital, or the child takes that human capital to the labor market and earns a return from it, okay? Um, so there's going to be an optimal degree of investment. So if you think about it, let's just take this equilibrium here with interest rate R and endowment given at each on the curve HH. At lower le levels of investment, the child is going to earn a higher return to his or her human capital than if the parent made a financial transfer to the child. If the parent made a financial transfer to the child and invested that, the rate of return would be R. But uh, in this area, the child's um, human capital productivity is greater and the, the return to the labor market is greater, so it makes sense to invest in the human capital of the child and make transfers in their human capital rather than making financial transfers uh, to them. And you will keep doing that and the, mar uh, the diminishing marginal productivity will drive you to this equilibrium. If you go beyond it, the return that the child earns to the money that the parents spent is less than what they would have gotten if the parent had invested that and bequeathed it to them. Okay. And so the economy comes to some optimal level of investment um, uh, uh, given by the intersection of the um, borrowing cost and the um, marginal productivity of human capital. And that determines the funds that the uh, parents will invest in the child. If the child is more able, they should uh, the parents will invest more in them in an optimal state. Now think of the situation of low-income parents of a very capable child. This child should go on to uh, earn a PhD uh, in the best possible uh, university. Well, that's not a problem for these parents when capital markets are uh, uh, perfect. They would make the, the optimal level of investment, whether they are rich or, or poor. Okay? So because we've got these perfect capital markets, we're disassociating the, uh, the role of parental income fr uh, from, from the child's outcome. So in our, in our intergenerational elasticity estimates, if this model is correct, all right, and we run our regression to the mean model and we get like so on an estimate of uh, for beta of 0.4 or so, in this model, the suggestion would be that that, that, that correlation you're seeing between parent and child in, uh, incomes is not causal at all. There is a certain endowment that parents have. Endowments are transmitted intergenerationally. And what we're observing in the correlation of incomes is the fact that there's some correlation in underlying en endowments and that the labor market continues to reward those characteristics. So we can't necessarily give a, a causal interpretation to a uh, intergenerational elasticity or intergenerational correlation uh, between incomes in this model. It's endowments that matter. The case is very different when capital markets are not perfect. And you, you might sort of um, uh, snicker or question the uh, perfect capital markets uh, assumption. Oh, hold on here, I think I'm about to sneeze. Ah, all good, it's passed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, now you, we might 
sort of snicker at the perfect capital uh, markets assumption when it comes to uh, human capital. But I, I'm, you know, I'm not so sure about that. You know, uh, when you sort of think about how uh, housing markets work, for example, um, parents might be able to invest more in their kids by getting into the housing market and getting them into a positive neighborhood in the area of positive, uh, uh, with very positive and high quality uh, 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 schooling. So it's that capacity to get into the market in in, in some way um, uh, that ma that matters. But be that as as it as it is, we don't generally, or banks don't generally, take the human capital of your children as collateral. And we can imagine that capital markets in this case function. And then that, that that's, for example, a rationale for student loan programs. Although there are actually programs, when you look more closely uh, at these institutions, that do allow you to use your future earnings capacity to take out uh, student uh, 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 loans. But here's a picture in which we're going to model less than perfect uh, uh, capital markets. Uh, SS is their symbol for the supply of funds argument. The more you invest, the more expensive it becomes. And, and, and so you see this upward slope. And again, we have uh, uh, two, uh, two um, uh, human capital um, marginal productivity uh, curves. But uh, we're also going to let um, the amount of parental income vary. So let's take this case, an endowment. The child has an endowment of E0 and parental income of Y0. And the supply of funds that the parents uh, face is given by this curve. Here are parents with a child that is equally endowed but having higher income. And so the supply of funds that they face is this curve. So here are children, all equally endowed. They have ability given by level E0, uh, but the child from low-income parents ends up getting less investment than the child from high-income parents. So two equally uh, able children are facing different prospects in the labor market because of differential investment in human capital. And in this case, we can think of income as causal. All right. Uh, so uh, here's another case where you have children who are very capable, E1, born to low-income families, and they end up getting, in this diagram, a higher level of investment, but still, not as high as they would if they were born in a high-income family. And in fact, their level of investment is less than a less capable child in a high-income family. So one might question whether this is a situation of equality of uh, opportunity. And in Becker's and Tome's words, the earnings of children depend directly on the earnings of parents as well as through the transmission of endowments. Income is causal. Okay. So it's the way capital markets are structured and the degree of investment that they impose for a given level of ability or endowment uh, on the child that drives the causal interpretation in this model. Like I uh, said earlier, or as I warned earlier, um, this model has been refined in a number of ways since 1986, but it's the starting point for a lot of literature and a lot, and a lot of thinking. Clearly, immediately, the policy thrust in this case, and, and it's the way that Becker and Tomes uh, worded some of the things, is to support post-secondary education or higher levels of education. And now we think a little bit more broadly about what investment is and the optimal time to do it. And we'll talk more about that later in, in, the, in the course. But here's the, uh, the setup. Uh, we're going to let family I contain one parent in generation T minus 1 and one child in generation T. Okay. Now, again, think back to some of the earlier uh, discussions we had in introducing the course where I talked about the importance of an inheritance, of an investment, and of a payoff. Well, that's reflected in these three 
uh, um, equations. Equation one is the payoff. It's what happens in the labor market to the uh, income or the log income of the child as a function of his or her human capital. Human capital has a payoff row. The more human capital you have, the uh, more income you get. We explain inequality by differences in the, uh, or rather the distribution of human capital across the population. Um, the return in this model is, uh, is the same, and we might question that, but we'll just take rho uh, as a given. That's the payoff. The, the parent makes an investment of I, I in the human capital of the child, and this is modeled as human capital being some function theta of, of investment plus the endowment. So that's getting us closer to the picture we saw where the endowment reflects on human capital but so does investment. And theta is our marker of the degree of perfection in uh, capital markets. If theta is, is equal to zero then we have perfect capital markets and it's the endowment that's going to drive uh, the, uh, the, these results. Uh, a theta greater than zero makes this uh, or gives a channel for income to start playing in these investments and starting a causal role. The endowment is rather mechanically transmitted uh, across generations. It's uh, an AR1 process, an, an autoregressive process. Uh, e in time t is uh, related to E in t minus 1. Um, Beck and Tomes call uh, lambda the heritability of, uh, of the endowment. So this parameter gives us a sense of how, how strong the transmission of, uh, of this other non-human capital characteristic is across generations. And um, new this term here is, is white nose. So this is what I termed uh, more colloquially in the early parts of the course as the, um, the inheritance, the investment, the payoff. Now, obviously that equation three, the endowment is going to raise a lot of questions in our mind, uh, uh, nature versus nurture, the, the role of genes and all of that. And to be fair to Becker and Tomes, and I mean, obviously that is a huge public policy uh, discussion one that we shouldn't uh, ignore, but to be fair to Becker and Tomes, they're very agnostic on the nature of this endowment. Some children have an advantage because they are born into families with substantial ability, a strong emphasis on childhood learning, and other favorable cultural and genetic, ge genetic attributes. Both biology and culture are transmitted, are transmitted from parents to children, one encoded in the DNA and the other in a family's heritage. Much less is known about the transmission of cultural attributes than of biological ones. And even less is known about the relative contributions of biology and culture to the distinctive endowment of each family. We do not need to separate cultural from genetic endowments, and we will not try to specify the exact mechanism of cultural transmission. They don't, but obviously there's a whole literature on this, and it's a very interesting literature uh, fraught with a lot of um, uh, uh, dangers, pitfalls, misinterpretations. Um, but I think the way we are approaching it, at least in the economics literature, is a little bit more refined, and we'll talk about this later, that children go through successive stages in their development. Each stage uh, poses risks and challenges that change the probability of success in the next stage. And, and, and each of those stages is also subject to investments, investments that have to be um, opportune, uh, they have to be uh, timely for children to get the most out of them and follow a path of success to uh, uh, independent um, uh, adulthood. And so modeling all of those stages, you might think in a more general way of that last equation, the endowment is sort of being a multi-stage, or, or maybe even the second, rather the second equation of investment, being a multi-stage uh, uh, series of, of equations, all reflecting endowments um, uh, and inheritance from the previous period and so forth. But for now, I think we should sort of um, just take Becker and Tomes at their word 
and sort of park concerns we have about nature and nurture. This could be as much about family culture as it is about uh, genes. It could be as much about networks as it is about uh, 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 personal attributes like uh, a risk aversion or time uh, 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 of preference, which all influence earnings. So if we just plow that um, uh, second equation into the uh, first equation, a child's income is going to depend upon, upon uh, the degree of parental I I investment and upon the uh, endowment. Notice how the road term comes in here. So let's make this something to do with economics in the sense that there's going to be uh, a, a choice involved subject to a budget constraint. Uh, the family's decision is to allocate a certain amount of um, lifetime earnings Y between the parent's own consumption and uh, investment in the child's. So parents face a choice. They have a certain amount of income in the period that they are uh, alive as adults, and they have to split that income between their own consumption and investment in the child. And they have um, a certain um, um, set of preferences over that. And Becker and Tomes model that as a utility function, um, that is a Cobb-Douglas uh, utility function, with this parameter alpha representing the degree of parental altruism. And again, that's a, uh, a catchword fraught with all kinds of emotive uh, issues. But for us, it's just the degree to which um, uh, current income is split between consumption and um, and uh, current consumption and the child's future income in the way that parents uh, value that. Now we could argue that there should be different things in this um, utility function. Maybe the parents should be caring about the uh, child's utility. And in fact, if I recall correctly, in the 1979 Journal of Political Economy paper, that's how it's modeled here. But they're clearly simplifying things, and they get traction uh, from that. So this might also be a, a catch-all for another important determinant of intergenerational mobility, um, uh, parenting style. Uh, and um, again, on the um, reading list for the books that you could review, um, there are, there's a really nice um, uh, book, and I've highlighted it before, on um, uh, parenting style and how it plays out in an era of increasing inequality. Also, the um, book by Mulligan, which dates back to 1997 now, makes a good, good deal of this altruism parameter and tries to endogenize it. But if we solve for the first order conditions, we get an optimal level of investment that reflect altruism, the rate of return to the market, and the degree to which capital markets are constrained. So this optimal degree of investment is going to be higher if the parent's income is higher. It's going to be higher if the parent is, quote unquote, more altruistic. And it's going to be higher if the return to human capital is higher. So it's sort of foreseeing the kind of return that the children will, um, will uh, face in the labor market, Rho, that incentivizes parents to invest more. And Rho is going to be sort of a marker for uh, inequality. Uh, the stakes are going to be higher for uh, children who are in a labor market in which human capital is highly rewarded. And so parents will uh, recognize that and they will make um, a different level of investment in human capital. And if capital markets are constrained, parents with more income not only have more resources, but they have more incentive to make those investments that will generate more human capital and more inequality in, in, in the next generation. Now, if that's the optimal degree of investment, we can we can put that into our, um, uh, uh, we can solve that for a relationship between uh, parental income and child income. And this looks a lot like our regression to the mean uh, uh, model, our statistical model, uh, that, that, that is, the model that, um, uh, that Solon and others have used. But I'd ask you to note here that we're not quite there. The error term is not well behaved here. 
So remember, E is an ARR1, and so it's correlated with parental income because they both depend upon the past level of uh, the endowment. This is a first-order autoregression with a serially cor correlated uh, uh, error, error. And um, in another paper that Gary Solon wrote, and which is in a book that I edited, and, and, and you should have access uh, 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 to that uh, paper, he shows, you know, using basic um, uh, first-year econometrics, how to solve uh, uh, this model when the error term is an AR1. And this is the beta that you get in uh, the steady state. This is the steady state slope. So this is how to interpret that beta that we often regress, assuming it's a steady state. It's some function of the return to human capital, the degree of, um, of imperfection in labor markets, and the inheritability of uh, in, in endowments. Okay, so it's a mashup of all of these things. And this is what the economists in the, um, in, in the class have been encouraging us to finally uh, get to. So we don't, in running that regression, we don't have an identification strategy that can causally pull out these different elements. Okay. But it is interesting, the model does make a prediction on nonlinearities. So for a given family, you can imagine them working themselves working their way through uh, two regimes. A regime in which they are credit market constrained and a regime in which they face no credit market constraints. So given the ability of the child, as the parental income increases, that is going to allow for the family to get closer and closer to the optimal degree of investment in the child, increase his or her human capital, and increase eventually their earnings. Until they reach a point, regardless of the ability of the child, the parents have enough resources to finance any level of human capital. Basically, they're working in another regime now of perfect capital markets, and uh, that beta is now going to become uh, uh, flatter because theta goes uh, to zero. And so the model predicts that the relationship between parental income and child income should be concave. Okay. Um, presumably at the individual level, if you aggregate this up, then presumably at the aggregate level. This is why if you read carefully um, Solon's AER paper, he struggles hard to try to put a uh, quadratic uh, term, uh, uh, parental income squared term, in his regression model to see if it in fact is concave. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough uh, observations in his data set to, 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 to find anything significant in that regard. Now, inequality in cross-section is determined by the same factors as mobility, uh, Becker and Tomes show us, but also by another. So in the steady t state, there's going to be a, a relationship between intergenerational mobility and cross-sectional inequality. And this, is going to be this can be expressed in this sort of long e e e e equation. And um, the variance of um, a second order autoregression is given by this term. So it's the, if you see here, the variance of the noise in the endowment that's getting passed on to the variance of income according to these uh, parameters that we've all spoken about. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so there is a lot of um, discussion about uh, intergenerational mobility and time, and analysts uh, assume that the degree of mobility will decline geometrically. So, in that simple regression to the mean model, if you recall that I drew on the bo on the board, uh, we had that sort of um, uh, motion to the mean that involved basically squaring beta in the second generation, cubing it in the third. So, if a the tie between a parent and a child is beta, and then run that through the next generation, 
beta becomes beta squared and beta cubed and becomes very uh, small very quickly. And in fact, in some public policy documents, the implicit assumption is that this is how the process works. Um, the OECD, for example, released a report about a year ago called the Broken Social Elevator. And they, I guess the communications department in the um, OECD struggled to make the intergenerational elasticity somehow more user friendly. And they translated it in these terms to the number of generations it would take to get to the mean if you were below uh, the mean. That's strictly not correct. If I, re um, uh, if I put this equation uh, back up here, this is the relationship between a child's income and the grandparent income. So there's a there's a, a growing literature now on mobility across multiple generations. You're seeing that even with the use of the PSID, uh, but you're also seeing it with other uh, administrative data. Actually, there's some very good papers based upon um, Swedish data, some in particular cities and some across the country that have uh, many generations stacked uh, uh, together. And in the becker tomes model, this seems to imply that grandparents have a negative uh, influence on, on, on the intergenerational dynamics and will read, uh, their ink will lead to even more rapid regression to the mean. And we shouldn't interpret it uh, uh, that way. Um, uh, Solon as well has written a couple of, of papers of that. This negative relationship is conditional on parental earnings. If the parents aren't making more than the grandparents uh, more when the grandparents' income is higher, it means that the parents themselves had a lower endowment. And it is this, this lower endowment, this bad draw that's getting passed on to the, to the child. And this is a testable implication of um, um, the model. And as I said, to the extent that this literature is coalescing on something, it's finding that um, grandparents actually figure positively um, um, uh, in uh, 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 child uh, outcomes. And it's interesting to think why that may be. Uh, grandparents could be investing directly uh, in the child's human capital as well as uh, uh, parents. Um, grandparents could be directly implicated in the child's life, contributing uh, to culture. Genes may skip uh, 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 generations. And the and, and literature talks about uh, other forces. Um, some of these sort of are, are more important when the grandparent is co-resident. And it's sort of interesting to find, uh, or the, the literature interestingly finds, that grandparents play a bigger, bigger role w w when they're present. All this uh, for you is to sort of uh, hint at directions where this, this literature is going based upon um, the, um, the very fruitful framework in, in, in Becker and, and Tobes. Now, for the economists in the room, I'd very much like you to push your analytical skills uh, with this uh, model. Uh, as an exercise, you can imagine making the endowment an AR2 and trying to solve the model. You should not at least sort of uh, solve out for, for uh, the beta uh, and, and develop a facility uh, uh, to do that and ask yourself some questions about how the uh, dynamics across generations occur. We also want to use this model as a starting point for understanding differences in trends, which will be another lecture, um, and uh, so differences across time, uh, but also differences across uh, space. And here is where I want to borrow on uh, Gary Becker's refinement, uh, actually, of the, uh, the first um, Becker and Tomes paper, the Journal of Political Economy paper, uh, in which the assumption is that capital markets are perfect. So let's make capital markets uh, 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 perfect is, is his starting point. And this is a short paper in the, in the book that I edited. And what he's going to interestingly do is also going to bring in um, uh, social investment, government in investment uh, in, in this model. So again, think back to what I was telling you earlier about three broad overlapping forces, the family, the market, and the state. This is the formalization of that. The parents' budget constraint is influenced 
by a tau, a proportional uh, tax that finances government spending. And it's that net of tax income that they use to consume or invest in their children. So the human capital of child is determined now by both private and public investments. Okay, so we can think of G as government investment in, in the child's education or more, more broadly in the child's human capital. And um, it's the degree of progressivity in, in this uh, governmental structure that's important for social mobility. And so what um, um, uh, uh, Solon does is he sort of um, amps up what goes into uh, beta, and he solves for this beta, where this gamma uh, coefficient is an indicator of how, how progressive public investments are, how much uh, how much more adva uh, uh, of advantage are they to the relatively disadvantaged? So we could have public policy that's a relatively more advantage to the already advantaged, and it will slow down mobility. If government policy is a relatively more advantage to the disadvantaged, it will promote mobility. It will lower uh, 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 beta. Okay, and that's what equation uh, 15 is is telling us. So. I know some of you are going to be more interested in um, variations in mobility within the United States and the literature that uh, the work by Raj Chetty, Nathan Hendren, and others has spawned. Um, uh, and, and so you might have this model in the back of your mind as to what the causal forces are um, across space within a country. And as we alluded to in the Great Gatsby Curve, also between countries, there could be a whole host of reasons why countries differ. And we haven't put parental altruism into this either. So fundamentally, societies could have very different family cultures, very different values. They could have a different structure of public investment in children. They could have different degrees of support in, 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 uh, in that investment in capital uh, markets, and they could have very different labor markets, more unequal labor markets reflecting a higher return. So all of those reasons come into play in understanding the different positions of countries along the Great Gatsby Curve or of different states or commuting zones or counties within the United uh, uh, States. And so this is sort of the, the framework or the structure, or the, uh, the, the, the hooks that theory gives us. And we haven't even talked about potential identification uh, strategies here to, to pull out those causal uh, uh, roles. And some literature is very, very focused uh, uh, on that. But the caution here is never to interpret that beta um, that we measure statistically uh, in, a, in a causal way without having some sense of the role of these underlying parameters. Um, oh, so this slide is, is saying uh, what I just uh, uh, talked about. And um, the other thing is, and the other question mark for us that I hope we'll visit in the coming lectures is also, we still have a very limited sense of nonlinearities non and what's driving them. And I'm going to suggest that the predictions that this Becker and Tomes model gives for nonlinearities don't hold up when we look at the empirical literature and there's a need for rethinking. And in fact, we'll study a, uh, a paper that Gary Becker and co-authors wrote, actually um, um, a paper that was published after uh, Becker's uh, death a couple of years ago uh, that tries to uh, revisit this puzzle that still remains. Uh, so here are the readings that I relied upon in putting this lecture together. Um, the crucial reading, of course, is this second one that I want you to be familiar with. Um, if you're not amongst the economists in the room, it's very much the, uh, the underlying intuition that, that's important here. Uh, I explained that in terms of those diagrams early on. And also, the structure gives you for, to think about uh, approaching uh, the, uh, the data. That's very important. Uh, 
and also avenues you see for future research in some very broad parts of the filing cabinets that are that make up this um, this uh, 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 theory. Again, uh, I um, want you to go back to that March 12th email so that you are uh, clear on the um, requirements uh, for the course. Um, I'll just get myself back to the beginning here. Um, uh, um, I'm going to be posting uh, as well with this presentation the presentation made by uh, Juliet on the uh, chapter in the uh, World Bank study, which gives you, again, a more intuitive understanding of the theory I've just tried to convey. And, and that's another important resource for you to hang on uh, onto as, as you move forward. Uh, next day, Aman is going to uh, offer up the presentation, and I'll also have another uh, video posted. Um, but remember, that you do have to engage with this video during uh, class time and offer one comment, question, concern, or reply to a comment and question concern on the website by uh, 4.30. Uh, with that, I just wanted to say uh, good luck. I miss seeing you in, in person. Um, but keep reading and feel free to get uh, in touch with me. But in the first instance, um, uh, engage by putting up a comment or question. Um, for example, um, I asked in a round table a couple of weeks ago in one of the lectures, you know, what you took from this lecture, what was the concern you might still have, um, what is the message you want to, uh, to give to your fellow students that will foster their learning experience. Think of those comments in those ways as a way to constructively uh, support everyone's learning environment. All the best, everybody.